The top number shows how many parts we are talking about. Oh, pretty simple. Let's go back to our example. There are a total of two parts to the pizza. So there's a two on the bottom and Cindy just gets one part. That's the part we're talking about. So Cindy gets just one half of the pizza. She doesn't get the whole thing. She gets just one part. She gets one half. The bottom number of a fraction is called the denominator. The denominator is the total number of parts. The top number is called the numerator. The numerator tells us how many parts we are talking about. In this case, Cindy is having one part of the pizza. The other part, of course, is going to Chomsky. Let's try this. Let's say there's another pizza and this pizza has four parts. The number four is the denominator because there are four pieces of pizza, four parts. Let's say Kelly shows up and wants to have one part of the pizza, one piece of the pizza. The numerator or the top number of the fraction is the number one because Kelly is having one part or one piece of the pizza. Kelly is having one-fourth of the pizza. Pretty simple, pretty fun. Fractions are awesome. Now we're going to need your help. Help us figure out what fraction is it? Huh. <laughs> what fraction is it? Wow, well, we're going to have a great time. Let's say we have a group of five sports balls. One is a basketball. The other four are soccer balls. Let's figure out what fraction of the balls are basketballs. What fraction of the balls are basketballs? So we know a fraction has a line in the middle and the top number is the numerator and the bottom number is the denominator. The denominator shows us the total number of parts or units. How many sports balls are there? Yeah, five. Five is the denominator. Good job. Now remember, we're asking for the fraction of sports balls that are basketballs. So how many basketballs are there? Yeah, just one. The number one is the numerator. So one-fifth of the sports balls are basketballs. One-fifth. Great job. Let's try this final example. Let's say there are five pets. Five pets! Two of them are dogs and three of them are cats. What fraction of the pets are cats? Huh, that's a good question. What fraction of the pets are cats? Remember, here's what a fraction looks like. It's got a line in the middle with the top number being the numerator and the bottom number is the denominator. So, the total number of pets is five. What number is the denominator? What number goes on the bottom? Yeah, five. Five is the denominator. It tells us the total number of pets. Remember, we're asking for the fraction of the pets that are cats. How many cats are there? Yeah, three. So what's the numerator? Yeah, three. Three is the numerator. Three-fifths of the pets are cats. Wow, that was so cool. 
but none of those cats are as special to me as you, Mr. Whiskers. Not even a fraction of my heart belongs to you. My whole heart. I love you, Mr. Whiskers. I do. I do. A fraction is something that shows parts of a whole. The top number of a fraction is the numerator, how many parts we are talking about. And the bottom number of a fraction is the denominator, the total number of parts. Oh, this little baby's putting together a little craft. You know, oh, it's so great. I just love that. That's, that's so good. Wait a second. That, that paper's from that book, isn't it? Okay, this is, see, this is, this is not an approved arts and crafts activity right now. Um, okay, we're going to have to take care of this, but first, let's learn about Roman numerals, which is a different way to write numbers, and it was used a long time ago in ancient Rome, and it's been used since then. And you can think of it almost as a secret code way of writing the numbers. It's pretty simple to learn, and we're going to go through that. The first Roman numeral we're going to learn is the Roman numeral I. And I is 1. I equals 1. So if you see an I with a Roman numeral, it's 1. The letter V is the Roman numeral that means 5. And... The letter X is the Roman numeral that means 10. So when you think 1, it's an I. If you think 5, it's a V. And if you think 10, it's an X. So that's it. Just those three. I, it almost looks like a 1. That's how you can remember that I is a 1. I is the Roman numeral for 1. A V is in the number 5 when you spell it out. The number 5, you see that right there? It has a V in it. So when you think of V, you know, oh, you know what? There's a V in the spelled out number 5. So V has to be 5. Now, 10 is X, and we can't think of anything that could remind us of that. So there is no memorization thing. Just when you see the X, it's 10, and that's just what we're going to have to do. Okay, one last time here. I just want to make sure you get it. There's only three. I is the Roman numeral for one. V is the Roman numeral for five. And X is the Roman numeral for ten. And you've got to understand that so that we can start playing kind of a game of putting them together and making numbers other than just one, five, and ten. So let's get started. So let's practice putting these Roman numerals together. What number do you think this is? You see two I's, and I is one, so the answer is two. Two I's is the number two. What about this one? What number do you think this is? There are three eyes. Yeah, it's the number three. Let's try this one. What number do you think this is? We see two X's and X equals 10. So 10 plus 10 equals 20. Great job. This is the number 20. Whoa, this one is so cool. Okay. An X and a V. What number do you think this is? The X is a 10. The V is what number? 5. Awesome. So what is 10 plus 5? 15. Whoa, thanks so much for helping out. Now that we've looked at how to put some of these together, I want to tell you about two 
special numerals that are a little bit different, and so you're going to have to just remember these on their own. The first is the number four, and the number four is represented with an I and a V, and the I is before the V because four is one less than five, which is V. So remember, with four, it's IV. With nine, it's similar, except with the X. Nine is IX. X is ten, and I is just before it, so nine is IX. Okay, that was really cool. Thanks for hanging out and learning those with me, but we're not done. We want to go through all the numbers up to 30 just using the numerals, and I want to see how much you've really learned. So if you'll do me a favor, as the numerals go up, I want you to say the numbers along with me, and we can practice together. Sound good? All right, let's get started. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. Well, there you have it, a new way to write numbers. Oh, wow, look, it's the homophone cow. Homophone cow. Ha homophone cow? You, you're just walking, you're just, you're just gonna ignore me? I, I see how it is. Okay, so you're upset that we haven't included you in other videos. What do you call this? You know, you're in a compilation video. That's cool too. Alright, I, I need to talk to the homophone cow. Uh, but in the meantime, let's learn about... Division! Division is such an awesome thing to be able to do. And you're going to have it all figured out. You're going to learn how to divide in this video. And we're going to start off with a story. There's this kid named Ethan. And Ethan loves carrots. He loves carrots so much. He loves to snack on them. He loves when he gets to eat them. They're crunchy. They're tasty. Yeah, carrots are awesome. In fact, I'm literally eating a carrot right now as I'm speaking. Carrots are great for your skin. Carrots are great for your eyes. They're amazing. They're a great snack. And Ethan loves them. Well, Ethan has two friends over, Kevin and Chloe, and they start to get hungry. Of course, they all love carrots because carrots are like the perfect snack. Now in Ethan's house, there are only three carrots. They're just three carrots. We are going to have to divide the three carrots amongst the three kids. So let's figure this out. How many carrots does each kid get? Do you know? Uh-huh, each kid gets one carrot. Pretty simple, right? Three carrots, three kids, each kid gets one carrot. Hey, did you know we just did division? Uh-huh, we just did division. Division is pretty simple. You see, division is splitting a number up by any given number. That's it, just splitting a number up. Let's look at our story again. There were three carrots, and we divided those three carrots by three because there are three people, right? The three kids that love carrots. And the answer of how many carrots each kid gets is one. Three divided by three equals one. Notice right here is the division sign. This is what it looks like. When you see that sign, you could just say divided by. 
So this reads 3 divided by 3 equals 1. Let's try another example of division. Let's say there are 8 presents. 8 presents and there are 4 women and we want each of the women to get the same amount of presents as the other women because we want it to be fair. Notice the division sign. We are going to divide or split up 8 by 4. Remember, to divide is to split up. Let's split these presents up into four equal groups. 1, 2, 3, 4. Alright, how many presents does each woman get? Uh-huh, 2. Each woman gets 2 presents. Isn't that cool? Division is so much fun and it's so easy. Remember, division is splitting a number up by any given number. That's it. Alright, now it's time for division facts. We're going to learn some pretty interesting facts about division and you're going to be like, what? Oh my goodness! Like secrets. This is super cool, okay? So just look around, alright? Make sure, alright, so cool's clear? Alright, it's time for division facts. The first fact is this. You can never divide by zero. It's true, you can never divide by zero even if you're a rule breaker and you're like, I'm gonna do whatever I want. You still can never divide by zero. In fact, if a teacher ever gives you a test and you see a problem where you have to divide a number by zero, just write on the test, undefined. Because that's exactly what that answer would be, undefined. It's impossible. Kind of like Mr. Whiskers' math skills. Does Mr. Whiskers do math in his head all day long? Who knows? His math skills are undefined. We just don't know. It's impossible to know. You know, Mr. Whiskers might know how to do division. Who knows? Undefined. You can't divide by zero. You can never divide by zero. If you ever see any division problem dividing by zero, just write undefined. It's impossible. It's impossible. So just write undefined. The second fact is this. You can write the division sign three ways. Uh-huh. Not just with that traditional division sign. You can write it like the division sign, or you can write a division problem with the slash, or with a horizontal line. For example, look at this. 12 divided by 3 equals 4. That's the original division sign, the one that you might see more regularly. But here is the same equation written in a different way. 12 divided by 3 equals 4. It's still a division sign, but it's a slash. It means the same thing as the original division sign. Remember, the division sign can also be a horizontal line. 12 divided by 3 equals 4. That looks like a fraction, doesn't it? The line in a fraction means divided by. These are the three ways that you can write the division sign. Pretty interesting. All right, the final fact is this. Okay, this is so awesome. You can flip the number of groups and the number in each group and the division problem stays true. For example, 10 divided by two equals five. And you can flip the two and the five and it stays true. That means 10 divided by 5 equals 2. Isn't that interesting? 10 divided by 2 equals 5, and 10 divided by 5 equals 2. You can flip the number of groups and the number in each group, and it still stays true. Or look at this. 18 divided by 6 equals 3. Remember, we can flip the number of groups and the number in each group, and it still stays true. 
So we could switch the 6 and the 3 and it stays true. So 18 divided by 3 equals 6. The 6 and the 3 can be flipped. So 18 divided by 6 equals 3, and 18 divided by 3 equals 6. Pretty nifty. Those were some cool facts. You know, division is a great time. Division is splitting a number up by any given number. It's a lot of fun, and we hope you learned a whole lot in this video. Oh, this is such a heavy cart. Oh, my goodness. Ooh. Ooh. It's hard work. You know, a lot of times learning can be hard work, too. But we hope that these videos are really helpful and make learning fun so that learning isn't hard like pushing this cart. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, what's the next thing we should learn about? Let's learn about even and odd numbers. A number belongs to one of two groups. Either it's an even number or it's an odd number. So what's going on? Why is this even a thing? We're going to talk about it. Even and odd is actually pretty easy, but it's just a matter of knowing what to look for. So we're going to be like detectives together, okay? You're going to have to have an eagle eye. To help us out on our quest, we're going to use dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are awesome. And here's a red dinosaur that's... I don't know why it's windy. There's wind going on. and I don't know. What's, what's, let's change the scenery. Let's, let's make it more modern day. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. Just walking through the neighborhood, strolling. He's ready to help us discover the secret, right, to knowing even and odd. So what is this key that we're looking for? What are we looking for that will tell us if a number is even or if the number is odd? An even number can be grouped by two. An odd number cannot be evenly grouped by two. So it's all about the number two, and that might sound confusing. Let me show you and you'll see. Here is the easiest number to do. We're looking for the number two. Okay? Can it be put in a group of two? Well, yes, because it's the number two. We've got two dinosaurs. That makes two even. Now, this is odd. This dinosaur's all alone. He's not in a group of two. This makes the number one an odd number because he's all alone. That's odd. It's an odd number. Let's look back at the number two. See, what's neat about this is it's an even group of two. That means our dinosaur has a friend. He can talk to his friend. He can hang out. It's not, it's not weird. It's not odd. It's an even number. Here we have three dinosaurs. Now, can we put the number three in even groups of two? Well, no, because that third dinosaur is all alone. The top two dinosaurs have somebody. Three is odd. There's one that's missing a partner. Here we have four dinosaurs. Now we're looking for groups of the number two. Now we have two groups of two here. That means it's an even number. Each dinosaur has a friend. Wow, five dinosaurs. But look, one on the bottom doesn't have a pal, doesn't have a friend. That's odd. It's not evenly grouped into two. Five is an odd number. Hey, buddy, okay, don't don't run, okay? We'll get back to the even numbers. I know you don't like the odds. You don't like being the odd dinosaur out. It's okay. I promise this next number is going to be even because it goes for even, odd, even, odd. Just hang on. <laughs> Man, dinosaurs, you know, so temperamental, you know? <laughs> I mean, what's that all about? I mean, a dog. A dog wouldn't have done that, you know? Dogs are better. I think now than dinosaurs, you know? I'm just kidding. <laughs> dinosaurs are so cool. <laughs> Moving on. Here we have six dinosaurs. Now each dinosaur has a friend. That means six is even. You can split it up in groups of two. Oh, here we have seven dinosaurs, but there's one dinosaur that's all alone. Six of them have friends, but one is all alone, doesn't have a pair. 
Seven is odd. The number eight. Does everyone have a friend? Yes, there's no one without a friend. Number eight is an even number. It splits up into two very nicely. Eight is even. Let's go even higher, the number nine. Now you can see really quick, it's easy to spot. Is nine even or odd? Yes, it's odd. There's one who doesn't have a friend. Nine is odd. Oh my goodness, 10. 10, is it even or is it odd? You tell me, you know how to do it now. You know the trick. Yes, 10 is even. Everybody has a friend. Now we're about to teach you two sneaky tricks that you can use with even and odd numbers, okay? So seriously, it's, it's well, it's, it's, not, it's not really sneaky, but anyway. So this first trick is that all of the numbers alternate from odd to even and back. And we're gonna show you what that means and what that looks like. Here we have the first 10 numbers, numbers 1 through 10. And the trick was, all of the numbers alternate from odd to even and back. Do you remember if number 1 is odd or even? Yes, number 1 is odd, because remember, number 1's all by himself, doesn't have a friend, doesn't have a partner, it's not an even number. Number 1 is odd. Now, we remember number 2, right? Number two is even. Yes, because it can be grouped in two because it is two. Now, if they alternate, that means which one is number three? It's odd. This is where it gets fun. If three is odd, then that means four is even. Good job. And if four is even, that means five must be odd. Yeah. And if five is odd, that means six must be, you guessed it, even. And if six is even, that means seven must be odd. Yes, seven is odd. If seven is odd, that means eight is, come on, what's the pattern? Eight is even, and if eight is even, that means nine must be odd. And if nine is odd, come on, is this not just the most fun trick ever? If nine is odd, that means 10 is even. They all alternate. So the first trick is that they alternate. The numbers alternate. Odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. Now, we're going to look at the second trick. The second trick is that with numbers bigger than 10, if it's odd or even, you can see on the end. With numbers bigger than 10, if it's odd or even, you can see on the end. To demonstrate, let's play a game we here at Homeschool Pop call Odd or Even. We're going to look at a number that's bigger than 10, and we're going to look on the end to see if it's even or if it's odd. Our first one is the number 21. Is it odd or is it even? It's odd. How? Why? Well, we look on the end. The end is a 1. A one is odd, it's all by itself. A one is odd, so 21 is odd because one is the ending. Did you know that means 71 is odd, and 101 is odd, and 131 is odd, and the number 1001 is odd. Why? They all end in one. Let's try this one, the number 32. Is it odd or is it even? 32 is even. Well, how do we know? Because of the ending. Look at the ending, it's the number two. Two is an even number because it's a group of two. It can be put in groups of two because it is two. 
The same rule applies. This is the second trick. With numbers bigger than 10, if it's odd or even, you can see on the end every single number that you can think of that ends in 2 is an even number. Let's try one that's a little more tricky. Let's try the number 100. Is 100 odd or is it even? One hundred is even! It's even, and we know that because of the ending. It ends in a zero. Now remember our second trick. With numbers bigger than ten, if it's odd or even, you can see on the end. And the ending is a zero, and every number that ends in zero is even. Let's look at the chart again. As you can see, ten on the bottom ends in zero and it's even. Every single number that ends in a zero is even. Just like every number that ends in a one is odd. Every number that ends in a two is even. Every number that ends in a three is odd because three is odd. Every number that ends in a four is even. And it goes on and on. Numbers that end in 5 are odd. Numbers that end in 6 are even. Numbers that end in 7 are odd. Numbers that end in 8 are even. Numbers that end in 9 are odd. And then numbers like 10 that end in 0 are always even. So there you go odd and even. As long as you learn these, you'll know any number because the endings always tell you if it's odd or even. So once you know these, you'll know all of them. Wow, Mommy, you're doing such a great job in your race. I had no idea you were an athlete, okay? I mean, with all that cloth wrapped around, you're doing great. You're doing a great job, just like these kids are doing a great job learning. In fact, how about this? The next thing we're going to learn about is multiplication. You're going to learn how to multiply. And if that sounds really scary or if that sounds like a difficult thing, it's just because you don't know how to do it yet. Once you learn the game, once you learn the process, it's fun. It's awesome. You see, multiplying is like being a detective. You're cracking a code, which is so cool. You're solving mysteries, like legit mysteries. Like, I'm I'm in an office building right now. There's a cake behind me. For some reason, I'm looking out right now at you guys, and I see that you're like, whoa, we're going to multiply. And once you learn it, it's just a game. So buckle in for the fun and the learning. Let's say you have two bikes, and for some reason they look the exact same, and somebody wants to give you an air pump. They ask a simple question. How many tires do you have to take care of? To figure that out, we're going to use multiplication. We're going to play the game. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so here is how multiplication works. So we put the number that's in each group, and then we put this x, which means times, and then the number of groups. So that tells us how many times that number is going to show up, and then we add them all together, and you've got your answer. Isn't that cool? And just a side note, to work, there has to be the same number in each group. Now remember, we're trying to figure out how many tires you have to take care of if you have two bicycles. Alright, now we have the wheels under each bike. Each bike has two wheels. One, two. So we write down a two. Each bike has two wheels. Remember, the first number we write down with multiplication is the number in each group. Then we write an x. This x means times. Two times. It's the symbol of multiplication. 
All right, the second number we write are the number of groups. You can see them here. How many groups do we have of two? How many? Yeah, two. So it reads two times two. To figure this out, we are going to skip count by two. Two, four. That means two times two equals four. If you have two bikes, that means you have four wheels. Two, two times, is four. Remember, this is how multiplication works. The number in each group times the number of groups equals your answer. Of course, to work, there has to be the same number in each group. All right, let's take this to the next level. Let's say someone has four bikes. And here are their wheels. Woohoo! Yeah! You know how to do this now. Each bike has two wheels, so the first number we write down is the number two. That's the number in each group. We're going to put the time symbol there and count the number of groups. One, two, three, four. So it's two times four. This is so much fun. This is multiplication. Now let's skip count to get the answer. Two, four, six, eight. Eight is our answer. There are eight wheels. Two times four equals eight. This is how multiplication works. We put the number in each group times the number of groups and we get our answer. You're getting the hang of it. All right, let's try this one. Let's say you buy three packs of trading cards. Let's say each pack had five cards in it. Huh, that's a pretty good amount. So three packs of five cards. How many cards did you get in total? That's a really great question. Sounds like we're going to need to multiply. So each group has five, so that's the first thing we write down, the number in each group. That's five. Put the multiplication sign, which is the X, which means times, five times. How many groups are there? One, two, three. So the second number is three. Five times three. What's five times three? We're going to skip count to find out. Five, ten, fifteen. 5 times 3 equals 15. You have 15 trading cards. Alright, this is how it works. You take the number in each group times the number of groups and you get your answer. Now here are some multiplication tricks that are going to be really sneaky ways that you can figure out multiplication problems really, really quickly. Here's the trick. If you multiply any number by zero, you always get zero. Always, you always get zero. Here's an example. Five times zero equals zero. When you have zero groups of five, that means you have zero. There are none. Whenever you multiply any number by zero, you always get zero. 100 times zero equals zero. Even if zero is the first number in the equation, you still always get zero when you multiply by any number. For example, zero times 11 equals zero. And 0 times 1,000 equals 0. If you multiply any number by 0, you always get 0. 
Oh, this has been so much fun. Here is the next trick. If you multiply any number by 1, it stays the same. Look at these. 7 times 1 equals 7. 100 times 1 equals 100. 33 times 1 equals 33. If you flip them, the answer stays the same. 1 times 7 equals 7. 1 times 100 equals 100. 1 times 33 equals 33. Honestly, the order of the multiplied numbers does not change the answer. If you were to flip the number of groups and the number in each group, you would still get the same answer. Though we still recommend this way, so simple, the number in each group times the number of groups to get your answer. So the two tricks have been, if you multiply any number by zero, you always get zero. And if you multiply any number by one, it stays the same. The final multiplication trick is to use multiplication tables. They come in all shapes and sizes, but they are all helpful, especially as you're first learning how to multiply. Here are some examples of multiplication tables. There's a table for all of the numbers from 1 to 10. Some kids memorize tables like these so that they'll know right off the bat in a moment what an answer could be for certain multiplication problems. This is how multiplication works. The number in each group times the number of groups gives us our answer. Here's our friend Fred. We heard that he just took up the harp. He just started playing the harp. Fred, we can't, we can't hear you. We're having audio problems with Fred right now. Fred, you look so happy playing. We, we can't hear you, okay? <laughs> you got, you got to wear your mic or something. We can't hear the music. Oh, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even, isn't that nice? You know, Fred is just plucking away. He's having a good time. You know, kind of like we're having a good time right now with these learning videos. And next, we are going to learn about perimeter. All right, let's show you how fun this is. Imagine I'm a race car driver, right? And don't make fun of my car, okay? This is this is a perfectly good car to do a race in, right? It's very fast. It's It's got the bells. It's got the whistles. It's a great race car, okay? <laughs> Stop laughing at it. Okay. <laughs> now imagine this is the race car course that I'm driving on, right? It's going around an oval. It's going around a shape. If I was wondering, how far is it around the track? What's the distance around the shape? Then I would need to know the perimeter. The perimeter is the distance around a shape. Wait, wait, wait. What is the perimeter? The perimeter of a shape is the distance around a shape. And it's easy to find. You can find the perimeter of a shape by adding all of the sides. That will tell you what the distance around the shape is. Great, now let's practice finding the perimeter. Look at this triangle. What is the perimeter of this triangle? Okay, first we need to know how long all of the sides are, then we can figure out the perimeter. With this triangle, all three sides are the same length. So how long are they? Let's pretend we measured it, and each side is 10 centimeters. Now remember, to find the perimeter of a shape, we need to know the distance around the whole shape. So we just add the sides together. What's 10 plus 10 plus 10? That's three tens. What does that equal? Yeah, 30. Awesome, the perimeter of this triangle is 30 centimeters. Remember, CM is an abbreviation for centimeters. 
30 centimeters is the perimeter of this triangle. Okay, let's try this one. What is the perimeter of this square? First, we need to know how long all the sides of the square are. Then we can figure out the perimeter of the square. Okay, so this is a square. It has four sides, and all four sides are the same size. Let's pretend we measured it, and each side is one yard. Remember, YD is an abbreviation for the distance of a yard. Each side is one yard. Remember, the perimeter is the distance around a shape, so we'll need to add all of these sides up. Okay, what's 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1? Yeah, 4. The perimeter of this square is 4 yards. The perimeter, remember, is the distance around a shape. If you were to go around this entire square, it would be 4 yards. Okay, this is the final one. What is the perimeter of this rectangle? Well, first we need to know how long all the sides of the rectangle are. Then we can figure out the perimeter. Remember, a rectangle has four sides, and two of the sides are shorter than the other two sides. With this rectangle, let's pretend we measured it at one meter on the short sides and three meters on the longer sides. Okay, remember, to get the perimeter, we have to add all of the sides together, so we're going to be adding four numbers together again. To make it easier, we're going to group the smaller numbers together and then put the larger numbers in our equation. What's 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 3? Those are all the sides. What's 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 3? Yeah, 8! That means the perimeter of this rectangle is 8 meters. Wow, we told you it was going to be fun. Oh, it's such a blast finding the perimeter. The perimeter is so much fun to find. It's like a game. Remember, you can find the perimeter of a shape by adding all of the sides. And the perimeter of a shape is the distance around a shape. Oh, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Now you know how to find the perimeter of something. The perimeter is the distance around a shape. I could find the perimeter of this tablet, right? All I would need to do is measure each side and add them together. And I would find the perimeter. But right now, I... I gotta find an internet connection. There's no Wi-Fi out here. There's no reason to be in the desert. I need water. There's not. This doesn't make any sense. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna go. You go ahead and find perimeter. Enjoy. The perimeter is a distance around the shape. Go. Have fun. Thanks for watching. We are so happy to have you with us. I mean, you are so awesome. You really are. Oh, you like my poster? <laughs> Mr. Whiskers poster, you know? It's pretty cool. Pretty cool, you know? <laughs> it's a pretty cool poster. Pretty cool cat, too. I wonder what he would like to learn about next. If he would learn from one of our videos, what would he like to learn next? Hmm. How about... Uh, hmm. Let's learn about three-dimensional shapes. This is going to be awesome. Love the 3D shapes. A lot of people know the 2D shapes. You might not know the 3D shapes. You're in the right place. Before we get started, let me just dance here real quick. This is really cool music. I really like this. You know, I like to dance. You know, some people, they're not dancers. You know, I, I dance. I dabble in dancing. You know? All right. That's enough. Can somebody turn that music off? I mean, seriously, I can't. I, I can't.
I can't teach like this. I can't teach with this music going on. You know, I feel like I'm in a candy shop. Let's just let's turn the music off, please. Thanks. So here they are, our old friends, the 2D shapes. You're familiar with these, you know? You're familiar with the circle, the oval, the triangle, the pentagon, the trapezoid, the hexagon, the square, the rectangle, the parallelogram, and the octagon. And these aren't all our, our shapes, our 2D shapes, you know? But these are all family friends of ours. We don't want to just forget about these. And before we look at 3D shapes, it's really important for us to look at these shapes again because these are old friends so we're going to look at each one of these one by one just to make sure you know who they are before we learn all these new shapes this first shape doesn't even need an introduction it's the circle the circle that round figure it's awesome we love this shape it's one of the first ones we ever learn the circle this next shape is one of the stretchy shapes, the oval. It's like a circle got stretched out. It's elongated. It's a tremendous shape, the oval. Here's another familiar shape, the triangle, three sides. We love the triangle. The triangle is great. The three-sided friend, three sides, a triangle. Wait, I keep saying we love the shapes. I mean, uh, we like the shapes, but do you love the shapes? Do I love the shapes? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I I need to take it easy here. Huh. All right, let's keep going. Ah, the square. A four sides, all equal. You know, the square's good. The square's a good shape, you know? Sometimes you just need a square. Sometimes you just need a square. Here's the rectangle. The rectangle is longer than the square because not all four sides are equal. The rectangle. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm, we're in the middle of something here, but I have to share this. Okay. So, what do you call a hamster with a top hat? <laughs> Abrahamster Lincoln. <laughs> I digress. The trapezoid, a cool shape with two of the sides being parallel to each other and the parallelogram, another four-sided shape. Both pairs of sides are parallel to each other. And finally, the pentagon with five sides, the hexagon with six sides, and the octagon with eight sides. What awesome shapes. So let's go ahead and do a quick 2D shape quiz. I need your help. I want to see if you really learned these, if you really know these before we get into the 3D shapes. So help me out here. We're going to have an awesome time. Wait, what? Is that my birthday? Oh, well. What type of shape is on the top? Yeah, a circle. What type of shape is in the middle? A square! Awesome! Okay, now, what shape is on the bottom? Of course, a triangle! Awesome job, now we've got more. This is a little trickier. Which shape is in the middle? Yeah, a trapezoid. Which shape is on the right? The pentagon. Good job. And which shape is on the left? Yeah, the square. Now try these. Which shape is on the bottom? Yeah, the oval. Which shape is on the top? Yeah, the parallelogram. Which shape is in the middle? All right, the rectangle. Great job. 
All right, the last one. Which shape is on the left? Yeah, the hexagon. Which shape is on the right? Great, the octagon. And which shape is in the middle? Phenomenal, the pentagon. All right, we're ready to learn the 3D shapes. We're going to learn how to identify the three-dimensional shapes. If you struggle through the quiz, you might want to watch the first part of the video again. Otherwise, let's get started. So as we're starting out, it's important to remember what makes a 3D shape a 3D shape. There's an old rhyme that says, 3D shapes are fat, not flat. And you can see that with the sphere, which is a 3D shape we're about to learn, and the circle. The circle is flat, but the sphere is 3D. It's three-dimensional, and all the shapes are like that. So let's learn all these 3D shapes. So the first 3D shape we're going to learn is the sphere, the one that we just mentioned. The sphere is the 3D version of the circle. It's perfectly round. There are spheres all around us. One of the spheres we see all the time are balls, like this soccer ball. A soccer ball is a sphere. It's perfectly round. It's a 3D circle. It's a sphere. You know this sphere. Yes, it's the Earth. It's where we live. Our planet is a sphere. How cool is that? Our own planet is a sphere. Perfectly round, it's a sphere. In this picture, we have two spheres. Can you spot them? Yeah, the two spheres are the two bowling balls. Perfect round spheres. Spheres are all around us. Here we have a group of three spheres, and you can count them right now. One, two, three spheres all together. The shape of a ball, a sphere, perfectly round. Well, there you have it, the sphere. What a cool 3D shape to start with. It's round, there are examples all around us, and it's just so cool. And you know what? The 3D shapes are gonna get even better. Our second 3D shape is the cone. The cone is a really cool shape with a circle as the base or the bottom, and it all comes up to one point called a vertex. Here's an example of a cone I think we all love, the ice cream cone. If it doesn't have any ice cream inside and you flipped it upside down, you'd be able to see the circle base, and it all comes up to one point called the vertex. Here are two cones, a red cone and a blue cone. And you can see both cones have that circle base and it all comes up to a vertex. What wonderful cones! Have you seen these before? They're traffic cones. Here are many cones. I didn't count all of them, but there's a lot and they're wonderful, wonderful cones. So that's our second 3D shape, the cone, a wonderful cone with a great circle base. It all comes up to one point called the vertex. How awesome is that? Our third 3D shape is the pyramid. I love the pyramid. The pyramid's great. It comes up to one point, just like the cone, except the base is a square, and the sides, instead of being smooth, they are triangles. Okay, like these are awesome! These are so cool, the pyramids of Egypt. You see that they have the triangle sides and the bottoms of these pyramids are square. They're awesome examples of the pyramid. This is a pretty cool pyramid. It's a decoration that you plug into the wall, but it's a great example of what a pyramid looks like. The bottom or the base is square and there's the triangles on the sides. How cool is this? Here's another pyramid, and it's made of glass. There are so many decorations and things around, maybe even your house, that are shaped like a pyramid because pyramids look so cool. People love putting them everywhere.
And there you go. I mean, you know, the pyramid, it's in good shape. You know, you see a lot of them around. They've got the square bottom or base and the the triangles on the sides and all goes up to a vertex. It's a classic shape. It's pretty awesome. Our fourth 3D shape is the cylinder. Now a cylinder is easy to spot because it's got a circle on the top and a circle on the bottom and it's smooth all around. Here we have a can of soup and it's a cylinder. It has a circle on the top a circle on the bottom and it's smooth all around. All cans and most jars are cylinders. Here we have three cylinders. They're candles. And can I tell you a secret? Most candles are cylinders too, right? Oh my goodness, this is just too crazy and too awesome. Here are two more cylinders. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Even batteries are cylinders? Cylinders are seriously everywhere. A circle on the top, a circle on the bottom, and smooth all around. I mean, really, the cylinder is everywhere. I mean, you know, the circle on the top, circle on the bottom, smooth all around. I, I, cylinder, like, what in the world do you have to be everywhere, okay? The next 3D shape is the cube. The cube is the 3D version of the square. It has six sides or faces that are all squares. Here we have two dice. Dice are in the shape of a cube. So these two dice are two cubes. They have six sides or faces that are all squares. Here we have many cubes. These are cubes that are made out of wood. Each of them have six sides or faces that are all squares. Here are seven cubes of ice. Have you ever had a warm drink and you need to put ice in it? It's awesome because it has this great shape. The shape of a cube. Six sides or faces all squares. I mean, there you go. The cube, right? The 3D version of a square, and it's got squares all along the sides, right? There's six sides or faces, all squares, and I don't know. I think it's a pretty cool shape. Our final 3D shape is the rectangular prism. The rectangular prism is the 3D version of the rectangle. It has six sides or faces that are all Rectangles. Okay, an awesome example of the rectangular prism are bricks. And here we have four bricks, which are four rectangular prisms. The 3D version of the rectangle. You may have seen this in your classroom or in your home. It's a Kleenex box. And the Kleenex box is a great example of the rectangular prism. It's got six sides or faces that are all rectangles. Okay, so the secret is most boxes are rectangular prisms. So here's another rectangular prism. And it's a box. And it's a shorter box. But it still has rectangles all around. And it's a rectangular prism. What else can we say? It's a cool shape. The rectangular prism is the 3D version of the rectangle. It has six sides or faces that are all rectangles, and it's just a neat shape to have around, I think. I mean, you know, it's yeah. cool. Hey! <laughs> so let's review. Pyramid Cylinders Sphere Cylinder Cones Pyramid
Rectangular Prism. Spheres. Let's do some more. On the top here we have cubes. We can tell that because it's a 3D square. It has six sides or faces. Each of them are squares. It's pretty cool. Do you remember what shape these bricks are? Yeah, a rectangular prism. They are rectangular prisms. They're the 3D versions of the rectangle. At the top we have a cone! A cone! It's got a circle base on the bottom and it all comes up to one point called a vertex. Do you remember the shape here on the bottom? These are three cylinders. They have a circle on the top and a circle on the bottom and it's smooth all around. You're doing such an awesome job. <laughs> Seriously, it's so cool. So what's this top shape? Do you remember? Yeah, it's a pyramid. A pyramid. A pyramid has a square base. It comes up to one vertex or one point, And it has triangles as the sides. All right, do you remember this last shape here on the bottom? Yes, it's the sphere, the sphere, which is the 3D circle, and we started with it, and we're ending with it, and it's so awesome! Wow, you completed the video. That is so impressive. Well, you might notice there's a circle right here on this video page that you can click to subscribe to our channel, or you can click this rectangle to go to another one of our videos. But keep learning. Learning is so cool.